I would like to welcome everyone for the session 1B, Building Research Capacity, Challenges and Opportunities. I would like to request our Chair of the session, Dr. Bharat Yadav, Ex-Vice Chancellor of Patan Academy of Health Science. Ms. Mona Rai, President of the Nursing Association of Nepal, to please join us on stage and take their respected seats. I would also like to request our speakers to join us on stage and take their respected seats. Dr. Ram Adar Yadav, Executive Director, National Ayurveda Research and Training Center. Dr. Biraj Man Karmacharya, Associate Professor, Department of Public Health, Tulikhil Hospital. Dr. Biraj Man Karmacharya, Dr. Keda Prasad Baral, Professor of Public Health, Patan Academy of Health Sciences. <laughs> Dr. Bharat Yadav and Ms. Mona Wright, please moderate the event and introduce our speakers to the audience. Namaste, good afternoon. Yes. Uh, you know, Usually in the post lunch session, everybody fall asleep. But I hope that our presenters are building very brilliant and they have very good, you know, subject matter. Probably they will not let you sleep. So we have hope high presenters today in this session. I P one B and. Uh, First presentation today is Ram Adhar Yadav. Basically, Ram Adhar Yadav is a executive director in National Ayurveda Research and Training Center, Government of Nepal, Ministry of Health and Population. He was awarded with Superbal Jan Seva III in 2077 BS. He is MD uh, and uh, Dr. Enta. NTR University of Health Science, AP India 2005 to 2008. And uh, today, the session is going to present research capacity building for Ayurveda and alternative medicine. So now I am going to request. Dr. Yadav to present this presentation. Thank you, Chair, respected chairpersons, co-chairpersons, respected dignitaries on the desk, of the desk, and all the participants. It's a 
great honor and pleasure for me that you invited national ayurveda research and training center to see something about research capacity building regarding ayurveda for ayurveda first of all i express sincere gratitude for organizers for giving me chance basically i am a student of ayurveda as you know you public health expert or public health scientist you basically focus on health care management rather than sick care management as you know ayurveda also basically focus on health care management initially rather than sick care management so first objective of ayurveda i don't have slide it's a communications gap between our organizer bhaini and me so verbally i present i say something regarding ayurveda sir sorry for that so basically we also focus on the health care management rather than sick care management the ayurveda basically have two objectives as you know is say our heritage our cultures of ancient system of medicines nepal is say also regarded as the rashtri chikitsa patti of nepal i think 99% of the populations of nepal once once in life they have used the ayurveda medicines but the challenges and the blaming of ayurveda is it every fair questioning on ayurveda is evidence evidence you don't have evidence it's your pseudo science but sir and all the scientist members who participated here i convey it's not a pseudo science it's a ancient medical science you can say it's having a holistic approach to treat the disease also but by the time passes the declination of ayurveda may be due to less investment on the research so see two kind of research i can i say two types of research in ayurveda we ayurvedic peoples we say the two types of research one is primary research second is secondary research primary research is which is mentions our textbook it's also research it's not a false written in our textbook on the basis of primary research on the basis of which is mention our ancient text ancient medical text book you can say who are doing secondary research and gradually gradually we are generating evidence also several research is going on regarding in this and our institutions also strive always documentations clinical research drug research and literary research also do because most of the textbook are losing we are also losing most of the textbook nepal somebody indians indian society claim the ayurveda is originated from india but we people also say no 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 ayurveda originated from nepal lot of thing contributed in ayurveda from the nepal in past we say sir everybody know one specialty that is you can say pediatrics that is kumar vritya in ayurveda the actual test book of kumar vritya was originated in ayurveda giving the ayurvedic text book from the nepal entire the society as a kashyap sahita so 
So, it's a need to do research. Dr. Akbar said, we people are not believing initially on in our textbook, in our system of medicines. But once any quotations came from the Westerns, only we believe. So, we should focus one principle also and request all the public health experts. You people are doing a lot of research in medical sciences, medical research, and you share your research. You join with us also and do research in Ayurveda principle also. Because it's a global on the theme of this seminar is also health network seminar. By networking, by networking, only we do the some net research. By saying that how we can build the capacity in the Ayurveda research, the first of the first of First of all, we should focus on the first infrastructure is the main thing. We have now, earlier, we don't have any infrastructures regarding research. Now, we have world-class infrastructure located in Kirtipur, Kathmandu, National Ayurveda Research and Training Center. And we are conducting different type of drug research, fundamental research and also clinical study. As earlier we say, clinical trial, once I say the clinical trials and modern friends means how you are conducting clinical research. You see, you can say the not clinical trial and clinical study because these medicines are used earlier. Not Compound, only element, derived compound are using in Ayurveda. So that's why the some preparation which is already used in Ayurveda, research, research, search, search, again and again searching. And for that way we are conducting the, uh, that is evidence also. So education and the training. Earlier, Nepal is a witness of the first medical schools. Nepal said most of the scholars don't know about the first medical education she started as Ayurveda in Nepal and also we have graduate and postgraduate degree and we also now incorporated research methodology in Ayurveda in graduate level not only postgraduate level from the beginning, in UG level, we are also teaching now the research methodology so that they can do some sort of research and they can build the foundations of research from the graduate level. As well as, we have one minute. Only one. We have also ten different sort of training giving research methodology our medical officer so that they can do this some sort of epidemiological survey and research in medical officer. Next is research and development. We are also doing some sort of research and development uh, regarding Ayurveda. Next, capacity of collaborations and networks. We have, we join the hand different national and international institute to explore the Ayurveda, to do the research in Ayurveda so that our system of medicine floods globally. Next, conservation of the traditional knowledge. And last one is standardization and quality control. We focus, basically, there are a lot of controversy in Ayurveda medicines also. Medicine, medical, so many Ayurveda drug is distinct. So, Standardizations and quality controls also we focus on uh, uh, to do the research in Ayurveda and last for public awareness. Public awareness is a very big thing. Without public awareness, only because what for what we are doing research. All are doing research for the well-being of the people. So 
I request all of you. you your time is just, just, just one minute, I please, madam. So I request all of you join for the well-being of the people and incorporate Ayurveda in your public health also. Thank you. Thank you, madam. I forget to tell you, question will be taken at the last completion of all the things. Thank you. Now, Madam, Mano will be talking, you know, he will give me introduction of next presenter. Thank you, Dr. Yadav. Continuing our presentation, I would like to request Dr. Birajman Karmachari. Please go on. And uh, he is the director of public health um, in Dhulikal Medical Hospital and he, he, is, he has done PhD in Epidemiology. Thank you. Continue your presentation, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon and uh, namaste everyone. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Uh, right at the beginning of the presentation, I'd like to uh, mention that by no means I'm an expert in uh, NCD research. Uh, but I'd just like to share some of the points uh, and the experience that we have had in the past few years uh, in the field of NCD research in Nepal. So uh, this is our institution. I come from uh, the Medical Hospital, uh, Pratham University School of Medical Sciences, uh, not very far from here. So in terms of NCT research in Nepal, I'm sure that most of us know that this field as a research field grew just only in, in the last 15 years or so. I still remember uh, when I was doing my PhD more than, uh, almost around like 12 years ago, uh, there were only just a few articles uh, that we had, you know, we could cite uh, published in Nepal. And most of the articles were from people like Dr. Avinav Vaidhi and others. It is very encouraging now to see that uh, the extent of research and the publications in NCDs uh, from, very, from various sectors in Nepal is really growing uh, very, very uh, in, an, in an encouraging way. Uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, in, amidst this, uh, this, um, this growth, uh, uh, we can still find some very good room for room for. Uh, for progress and uh, uh, some new opportunities that we can tap into in coming days. Uh, I have categorized my presentation into like three major areas. Uh, the first one uh, is regarding the role of academia. Like how can academia contribute in NCD, NCD research in Nepal? One of the things that we have experienced is that uh, you know, building a very rigorous research training uh, uh, in academia uh, through diverse and innovative training programs is very essential. Uh, most of the time, the research training that we get are part of the curriculum. So either it is in bachelor level or master's level or, or other programs. But we, we, we can still, as a country, uh, develop some new programs uh, like research fellowships and very specific trainings around like NCD research and so on. Uh, we haven't done, as a country, as a country, we haven't done much progress in that area. So I think that as academic institutions, we can think of developing some innovative models around that. We, we, we experimented with a sort of a fellowship program on uh, translational research capacity building for NCDs uh, for cardiovascular diseases in Nepal, in which we, uh, we enrolled about 22 fellows from the government sector and also various, various sectors. It was a four-year four year long uh, on-the-job program and the response that we have got from that training has been very encouraging and we believe that in coming days if we can organize fellowship programs like that, that would be very good. This will require you know, fostering collaborations across different disciplines. Most of the NCT research that happens, that, that are happening now, are happening mostly in monodisciplinary way. So either you see public health professionals publishing or doing research in NCTs, or you see clinical teams doing studies on NCTs, but there is a lack of uh, more multidisciplinary collaborations on that. I would also like to emphasize here that um, as, a, as a nation, uh, 
uh, we also need to do something very significant uh, to draw the attention of like, more clinical practitioners uh, in research as well. That has also been uh, lacking. So that is another major area we can improve. We can also enhance collaboration between public health professionals, clinicians, nurses, social scientists, and others uh, in, in, in NCDs. And the final point is uh, the disconnect between academia and government, which is really pressing. We can see that in the last few years, this has improved significantly, but there is still a lot of room for improvement. When the government is coming up with major national level policies and programs on NCDs, I think there, there should be some strategies how different, different sectors of academia can be aligned with that so that they complement each other uh, in the process of um, generating new evidence uh, uh, for, um, for, uh, for the health system. I'm just uh, citing one example of uh, the formation of consortium of academic institutions uh, for public health in Nepal. Uh, we recently launched this consortium uh, comprising of uh, nine different uh, universities and academies that are running public health programs in the country. And one of the major goals of forming this consortium was to tap into each other's expertise and strength. Every institution has its own strength and its, and its own limitation. But as a nation, if we can come together as a, consortium, as a consortium, we can really support each other. Public health, as a discipline, you know, we have to acknowledge that uh, as a professional society, we are still very fragmented. The professional identity of uh, public health is still a little bit, uh, it, it has not yet been very consolidated. So, so I think uh, that is something we can focus uh, on coming days. The second category I would like to focus is, on, uh, focus is around the role of government and external development partners. Uh, uh, it is encouraging to see how uh, Nepal Health Research Council has you know, come up in recent years uh, to be the real, uh, uh, you know, real, real apex body for uh, for research uh, in Nepal. Uh, there are also encouraging uh, news uh, currently, recently, you know, from the provinces, university grant commission, and, and various other uh, you know, government and non-government entities focusing around uh, research support. Uh, uh, but I think we can uh, we can we can do better than that. Uh, one one thing that I specifically want to highlight is that um, institutions like the Nepal Health Research Council, uh, Ministry of Health and Population, and, and other government entities should focus around establishing some centers of excellence. One institution cannot conduct all the studies. And if we disperse the studies in all the institutions, that is also not a good strategy. So we need to tap onto the strengths of each institution and facilitate in creating centers of excellence around different institutions. So that is one strategy we can, uh, we can adopt uh, for NCDs as well. Uh, you know, arrangements of grants and other research funding, which has been very encouraging in recent years, needs to be uh, expanded. And another important point is the openness and nimbleness uh, of government uh, for collaboration with academia and research institutions. As researchers, we have a very, very hard time getting access to government data. Uh, even if it is de-identified, even if we know that that data is very valuable for generating evidence, but there is no clear mechanism or protocol in place to get access to that. And by the time we get access to a lot of this government data, you know, most of them are outdated. So that doesn't work. The you know, government system is the largest public health machinery in the country. And we have to figure out a way where we can use data as fast as possible to generate some real, real-time evidence that can support in policy making and uh, and health systems are strengthening. So that is something we need to make significant uh, improvement. We should also open new research avenues. You know, most of the studies uh, we've been focusing around has been around the epidemiological studies uh, and so on. So you have uh, one minute more. So focusing around uh, health financing and implementation research and other areas would be another important point. And my final uh, point is around the role of international institutions. This is a very a special day where we are launching this global health network with institutions uh, like Oxford University and uh, Bragg and other institutions. So I think uh, creating these institutionalized collaborations will support uh, all of these research endeavors. We have to focus on equitable partnerships 
and also acknowledge the differences uh, in the research ecosystem that different countries have. So the research ecosystem that is present in, in, in the UK is very different than the research ecosystem that we have here. So we have to acknowledge that as well. The, <clears throat> the steps that have been taken in the past few years have been, has been very encouraging. And you know, we might not be able to change everything you know, over the course of few years. But at least if we can create a model, then others will follow. So that should be our goal. Um, and you know, I'd like to end uh, uh, with a quote uh, that says that you know, e over every mountain uh, there is a path, although it may not be seen from the valley. So sometimes it might appear to be very complex, That's very confusing for us, ourselves. but but if we work together, I think we can figure out a way and and be a model of success uh, of NCT research in low low resource settings as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas, for your kind presentation and the question will be taken in the last. I would like to Dr. Bharat to introduce another presentation, sir. Thank you. Kali Kote. This is Bhagwati Kali Kote. She has master in child health nursing and she is lecturer at Maharashtra Nursing Campus in the Institute of Medicine, Tirun University. And uh, she has training and certified member of the Society of Transnational Academy Research, a scholar and staff. So uh, I request Bhagwati, Madam Bhagwati, to present her presentation. The time is 10 minutes. Thank you, sir. Respected peers, respected dignitaries, all the guests and participants, Namaskar and good afternoon. First of all, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the organizer for providing this opportunity to me. Today I am going to present about research capacity building in nursing. As the nursing profession has advanced, research capacity in nursing has become increasingly important to the profession's development. Evidence-based practice is the main demand of the context worldwide. As healthcare professionals, nurses are responsible for delivering the evidence-based quality care and that must be bring through the research studies. For evidence in nursing, in nursing practice, such studies can only be conducted if excellent research capacity exists in the nursing discipline. As the research capacity in nursing is the continuous and long-lasting, never-ending process, it requires the continuity and settings and supports for the conduction of research activities and capacity improvements in a specific context like in clinical setting as well as in academic setting and in normally used in non-individual manners. It suggests the concept of macro prospecting. Individual nurses being competent in research can contribute to the research capacity but to be a research capacity in nursing disciplines, all the nurses who are involved in nursing, academic and in clinical setting have competence in the research. Competence, motivation, infrastructure, support, and collaboration for the nursing research are the key antecedents for the research capacity in nursing. Individual competencies for the nursing research is the foundation of the ability to conduct the nursing research activities which brings through educational programs, training mentorships, journal crop involvement of the nurses, attainment of the nurses in uh, seminar and workshops, 
at academic meeting and experience learning opportunities as well as research facilitators support which may improve the providing competence in individual nurses toward building the research capacity in nursing. The another factor is motivation which is the willingness, desire and interest in research of the nurses that can be bring the relevant to the practitioners or uh, research which is objective based on and the outcome of the research can be used by the practitioners it can be relevant and the research culture the another important factors which motivate the nurses to involve in the research is research cultures research cultures is the peer supports organization support and the encouragement reward and research supports within the organizations and the another factor is support set up to enable a smooth and effective running of the nursing research activities which can be academic support material supports and management supports management supports can include supervision mentorship export consultation learning opportunities export partnerships and material supports that is time, human resources, equipment, funding, library and the software needed for the research activities and management supports is organizational environment. It's also fall under the motivation that is the creation of the research culture within the organization. Research is the activity of many people who engage for generate the knowledge, therefore the collaboration is precondition for the research capacity in nursing. Academic and clinical collaboration, novice in export collaboration, multi-site collaboration, intra and internal professional collaboration, internal interdisciplinary collaboration are needed for the building the capacity of research in nursing. And this can be done through the organization coordination networking for the research, support from different organizations and support from policy level. The direct outcome of the research capacity in nursing is research achievements which build the nursing knowledge of the nursing disciplines and evidence-based practice. That nursing research achievement can be manifested in more publications. Nurses can attend the conference and present their research findings and they can run the projects and get the grants and fundings. And the nursing knowledge building can improve the quality of nursing care, better nursing education, development of the nursing discipline and nursing profession development. And ultimately it brings the evidence-based practice, better patient care, better patient health outcomes and enhance the patient safety and quality care. And if nurses provide the evidence-based practice, it brings the satisfaction, satisfaction to the patient, satisfaction to the nurses, satisfaction to the organization, satisfaction to the society, ultimately decrease the nurses' turnovers and provide the cost-effective care. There are research provision as a subject from bachelor level in nursing disciplines. And in some universities and academic sectors, there are provision of marks for the promotion to the research and publications and some funding also available like by a Nepal Health Research Council and University Grant Commission. And competency-based practices only performed by nurses on the basis of training forms which was generally provided by Nepal Health Training Centers and in the morning session, uh, one of the speaker mentions about control of postpartum hemorrhage that may, is the product of evidence-based research, research product and that is practicing by the nurses. And almost all nurses research are 
descriptive in nature and there is the lacking of interventional research in the nursing field. And nurses feel there is the barrier to practice the, some findings of the research they know, but there is the barrier to practice in their day-to-day -day life. Uh, main barrier is organizational barriers. That constant is insufficient authority to change the practice, lack of time, insufficient human resources, and insufficient resources to implement the research knowledge and the quality of research and generability of the research findings. And one of the study mentioned that there are 75 percent of nurses mentions there is the barriers to implement the research finding in their practice. So, what are the way forward? Educational update or research on research methods that includes the, all the research methods, not only the descriptive, it focuses on the action research and implementation research. Initiation of nursing research projects on evidence-based nursing practice with collaboration in the different disciplines, different, different sectors and involvement of the nurses by lead by the nurses. And macro and micro level supports that include the support from the policy levels and within the organization by nurses leaders, the managers and peer support it also enhances the nursing capacity, research capacity in nursing and facilitates the research utilization by providing the authority to practice evidence-based outcome and provision of the funding and needed resources for the research to which build the capacity of research in the nursing. Your time is up. Thank you. So thank you, Madam Sarvati. And uh, now we have uh, next presenter, Dr. Kedar Prasad Baral. Dr. Baral is Professor of Master of Public Health at Patan Academy Health Science. He did his he did his Master of Public Health from Royal Tropical Institute, Netherlands, and. Uh, Professor Baral is founding chair for the Department of Community Health Science of PAS and in his leadership MP, MPH program was started at PAS. Not only that, he is former rector of Patan Academy of Health Science and at present he is in big position at PAS, so he is service commission chairperson at the Partner of Academic Health Science. So I request Professor Baral to start his presentation. Voice problem. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this presentation. This is community engagement for resource capacity is a fluid discipline. Actually, compared to other disciplines, this is quite fluid. This is art and science. And there are few issues before introducing these topics. There are few issues. We should have a mindset first to prepare the community engagement about. Consider recognizing people who can contribute. That's very, very important. Are we ready to change our hat? Communication, relation, and recognition. These are few, uh, I think, prerequisite to engage community for uh, research or any program. With this background, I will quickly go through because we are. This is a process of collaborative work wherever we work. Uh, the objective is build trust, actually, better communication. This morning, people have been talking about engagement, customization, relationship, all of this encompasses into the community engagement. Partnership, are we considering client or partner? We can work together. It's a, it's a mindset, how we interpret, that's very, very important. 
Resource sharing, we always consider resource as only money. The resource is more than money. It's, it's very important to realize. And empowerment, finally, ownership. For whom we are working for research? Is there ownership for the community or not? That's quite important. That depends on translation. Translation, if we engage up to the ownership level, the translation will be much more easier. The same, the area are health program policy and research. Why we primary aim of this engagement is there are social determinants. It's not the technical issue. There are social determinants. If we recognize social de determinants, then community engagement is must. It's grounded principle on fairness, justice, considering people as people. This is very, very important. Empowerment, participation, and self-determination. These are very, very fundamental principles that one has to work. Internalize, not only read, to internalize before working on this. You can, we can, the perspective, how we look at, we can see as a system, system perspective, social perspective, there are individual community groups, leaders, there is a dynamics, it's a community perspective. If you consider unit, then system perspective. These days, virtual is also coming, individual perspective, like I and me. I consider, how you consider, uh, me as, you know, they, these are important fundamental thinking. That's why this is a social science. Concept, while working, community engagement, most important part is understand the context. Where we are working, which community, which ethnic group, which age group. These are all, you know, time, whether they have an interest on that or not, type of issue and continuum. That's very important. Are we talking about a tokenism or are we talking about continuum? This is a schematic presentation of a village of Nepal. This is just a schematic presentation. See the dynamics, see the relationship. What I was talking about, relationship, communication, recognition, all of these characters in the community and we should be able to communicate, act, build relationship, recognize them as group or individual. Whether children, old people, geriatrics, palliative or sick or healthy. This is, this is a conceptual framework. Uh, that is, I use this framework a lot. To, to internalize and conceptualize uh, many of the research and the project while we were working at Patton Academy of Health Sciences. I just would like to give an example. We have a project, we do have a lot of research and project uh, within the academy. Here I am presenting a palliative care, community based palliative care program. Ministry of Health is engaged, provincial government is engaged. Local government, we do have an MOU and we, we train and the health worker, local health worker. Actually, we start engaging community while training the health worker. We conduct one month training, palliative care training for health worker. We train for case management at Patton, Patton Hospital and for two weeks, we took them to village. How they build the relationship with the community, how they react, how they visit the family. That's quite important, you know. Engaging, even training, research, whichever we do. Recognizing that they are the part of it. There is a determinant. We have to recognize, we have to change, 
I won't say removing heart. <laughs> we have to change our hearts. We we are big. We are professional. Then then things will easily go wrong. This is what I want to share with you. With this seven minutes, I think. Thank you. Okay, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Dr. Bishnu uh, Cholagai. He is an associate uh, professor at the Institute of Medicine and a life member of National Public Health Foundation. And he has done his MPS. So please, uh, your floor is yours. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you, our uh, presenter, Professor Kedar Barad, sir. Uh, he has introduced the topic as well as given some examples uh, and models from uh, pattern economic health science as well. So, actually, we have a similar topic in presentation. That's why we have done it actually combined in combined form. Uh, so, with this. Uh, I'd like to continue with uh, partnership with communities for research capacity building, evidence and prospects. So basically, I'll be sharing what uh, evidence have supported and what are my uh, experiences, our experience at the Institute of Medicine, where I have worked for about 18 years in community-based education. Uh, so uh, previous research findings as well as prospects, uh, like uh, what we are currently going now, that I'll be discussing. So before that, actually, while I was listening to the inaugural session, keynote speech and guest speakers, uh, that, uh, that, that is a very much foundation for our presentation of this community engagement. Like, uh, uh, it was emphasized that training of grassroots health workers is very, import very important in the research capacity building. Because while we are engaging communities, they also need to know and uh, we also need to learn from them the indigenous knowledge and we also need to uh, empower them with uh, skills on research as well. So, likewise, uh, work of community researcher is not recognized and which actually uh, is an impediment to our uh, efforts in community engagement and the results. So, it also came that barefoot researchers and so many similar things. No? And dissemination of the research findings we do uh, mostly in uh, professional settings and in big cities where the community people are not given a chance to participate or very limited chances. So building on this, I'll be sharing some of uh, our research experiences as well as our ongoing research project on community engagement specifically. So. Uh, this uh, comes uh, from the background of uh, my own presentation at Global Health Network Seminar, uh, like conference, Global Health Network Conference of uh, 2022 November, uh, where I presented on equalizing community university partnership for health professional education in Nepal, which was based on uh, my previous study, which is also published in Advances in Medical Education and Practice, and now. Uh, currently, we are doing a study, uh, briefly, I will explain it in the context. So, community-based, uh, it, it has a background on community-based medical education, uh, because in Nepal, not only the Institute of Medicine, where I work, all of the medical schools have incorporated residential field activities as integral part of their curricula, focusing on training of students, service to the community and research. And the research is actually not very much uh, unfocused and it is gradually coming uh, because we have to engage communities in research as well. So our previous study and experience have concluded that students have benefited from the community-based education. However, there is little impact on community empowerment and the engagement of local health workers. So we have our universities have objective of uh, objective that the students should learn about the community and learn from the community. But what is our responsibility towards community and 
whether they are equal partners with the university or just the recipients uh, and less empowered. So that is the main issue. So because of that, this unequal footing of universities and communities in community-based education that raises ethical concerns and which is also impediment to realizing fullest potential of community-based education. That's why there is a crucial role of universities in introducing students who are also future health workers to more democratic ways of working with the communities. Uh, as I told that, at the time of my previous presentation at Cape Town, we, we had submitted a proposal to UK Research and Innovations Medical Research Council, which is luckily funded and we are conducting this study. Uh, here, we will be working on the engagement of communities as equal partners with the university and other organizations involved. So, whatever organizations involved in this community engagement activities, communities should be equal partners. Starting from the identification of uh, problems, planning, and teaching their indigenous practices to us as professionals. So, Community members, university students and researchers need to come together to develop methods for co-investigating local health knowledge, which is our ongoing activity of research. This will facilitate two-way learning process between health professionals and communities leading to co-construction of health knowledge. So our approach will be community-based participatory research, which is actually a flexible one. That's why if uh, some of the uh, suggestions or queries that will be raised from this uh, the audience we will be able to incorporate st still in our research because it is the nature of a participatory action research that uh, we can it is ongoing and methodology can be changed in between as well based upon the need so here we will do the participant observation in the communities facilitating communities in identification of health problems uh, designing community led health interventions and dissemination of findings at local, national and international level. So we, we will first disseminate findings where we have, we will conduct research. So as it is uh, being, um, the three countries are involved, UK, Nepal and Philippines, and international conference will be organized. However, we will do the dissemination uh, starting from lo local level and national level as well to, to empower the communities and engage them uh, fully in the research process. This approach builds within the framework of existing academic programs and local organizations like community learning centers to ensure sustainability, affordability and feasibility. Like community learning centers are already there, it is actually under the um, under Ministry of uh, Education and uh, this is also, as we can see, this is also educational research and uh, we need educational science expertise as well as yeah, need to coordinate with education sector. So CLCs are already there and uh, they will be developed or they will be continuously utilized. Finally, uh, this is the final slide. So I think other things in uh, engaging communities which we have also experienced uh, from our working, uh, from our work in the institute not only me, but our senior professors, colleagues have emphasized that identifying teaching communities and strengthening the existing centers. For example, uh, Tribune University Institute of Medicine has field training center in Chautara. So these kind of centers should be strengthened and new centers could be uh, established by Tribune University and other academic institutes that will support community engagement and community-based uh, research activities as well. This approach will also facilitate follow-up of service and research through community-based education. So uh, there should also be service components as I, as I described in the first slide. And uh, if we have such center, it can facilitate regular service activities so that communities will also be in interested and they will also benefit from the program. Furthermore, regular sharing of best practices of community-based education among the universities and academic institutions and other stakeholders would help design a more effective modality for community engagement and community-based uh, education and uh, research activities. Uh, so I think the opportunities is here, network, this, this is also uh, building research capacity through networks, so I think but there are challenges in uh, maintaining network as well that, that, that has been 
emphasized in earlier by guest speakers uh, as well. But with this challenge also, we should move uh, with the networking and uh, working together among not only among the universities but other stakeholders and community learning centers and other sectors as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I have one, one minute seconds. So thank you. <laughs> you finished your presentation. Uh, now I would like to open the floor for questions if any there. So we can take uh, two to three questions. Uh, please be specific and you can uh, put your questions on the floor, please. Thank you. No questions? and Ms. Manarai for some comments for the session. In this session you heard about the research of academia because our presenter were from the academic institute and uh, you know one of our presenter tell that, told that Either in academic issues, research is being done for promotion or, uh, you know, for the resident. Because I am working also in academic institution and I have a vice chancellor there. So, and that is true because in our country, research culture is very poor and still. But, however, we are growing slowly. If I, because I, I am graduate from Institute of Medicine Maharajan and did my MD GP there. And uh, that time, it was 27 years ago, there was no research in, in, because Institute of Medicine is primitive institute. There was no research and no thesis. I did my MD without thesis. But the scenario is not like that before. In every academic institution, uh, you know, either for promotion or you know, a resident have to write thesis and, you know, uh, there are certain, uh, you know, paper you have to show. And there is institutional review committee also. But even though, I think there is, most challenging part is funding, as our friend, few friends said that. People, you know, students and then, even, you know, faculty, they are afraid of doing research because of lack of funding. We don't have enough funding. We need it. For qualitative and quantitative research, we need funding, we all know. And another thing is guidance. Again, guidance is very, very, very important. And uh, I think, you know, today's event, will be very encouraging for the researchers in the future because there is networking and what I have understood is that this will be a teamwork and if there will be teamwork there will be many hands and if we put many hands together we can conquer anything you know so that is my, uh, and uh, we are hopeful and we all are hopeful and I am too. And Dr. Bar last, Dr. Baral and uh, last presenter from Institute of Medicine, they said that community engagement, I think that is very, very important. Because in academic institute, most of our research is limited to the either hospital, mostly in the hospital, and then we most of the NCDs, yes, we know that NCDs are growing, but we have to go in the engage the community also. As Dr. Paral mentioned about their community engagement, participation, training, communication, and even social determinants are very, very important things in the research world. Because, you know, our issues are limited in, 
urban area, but we don't know what is happening in the rural area. What type of diseases? I think in academia, every academic institute, our one friend from IOM said that students go to the community and do the research. I think that is very, and I, you know, I think every academic institute should, should go to the community and do the research. And I'm not going to tell much, but I think challenges are there. The life is full of challenges. Today's our thing is, if we don't get challenges, we can't do anything. But to overcome the challenges, we have to search the um, you know opportunities, and and we should not move backward. We should go forward. So in conclusion, I think. This networking will definitely build the research capacity and we grow older in research things. At last but not least, I'd like to thank, you know, Nepal Public Health Foundation inviting me and uh, giving the opportunity to take the chair in this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yadav. Now I would like to request Ms. Mana Rai to please share a few words. Namaste and good afternoon. Khai kut pet ma sabay lai ali kati ninda apni lage ro ki dere buje ro ki na buje ro koi sune aaye na. Tapan it was very interesting. I would like to thank you, the four or five presenters, uh, for your uh, quick, short and sweet presentation. Hope for your future uh, to conduct a research uh, according to your concerns. So thank you very much. I would like to thank you, uh, Public Health Foundation, Dr. Mais Maske and his team. And uh, thank you listening us this afternoon uh, with your very good enthusiastic interest. Thank you very much. And as I am president of nursing association, uh, our nurses are doing research uh, for their academic purpose. But today's presentation directed that nurses should do research in the community level and uh, based on the patient's problem that is evidence-based. So we nurses are very, very much eager to learn, uh, teach them, guide them, and do our research on. So thank you very much for giving us the floor to explore our interest in nursing research. So thank you very much. And I would like to thank you, the international uh, consultants, uh, founders, of the public health uh, networking building building network. So I'd like to thank you very much and would like to see you working together in the future. Uh, so <laughs> now I would like to uh, thank you again for our presenters. Keep doing your good work. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rai and Dr. Yadav for your remarks and for moderating the session. Thank you, respected speakers, for your invaluable insights and the participants. Now I would like to request our chairs of the session, Dr. Bharat Yadav and Ms. Mona Rai, to please present the token of appreciation to our guest speakers. Ms. Bhagwati Karikote, and Dr. Vishnu P. Chawla
I would like to request Dr. Bhadi Raj Pandey, Chair of Appreciation, to our chairs of this session. To Dr. Bharat Yadav. To Ms. Mona Rai. Now we will be proceeding. Cameraman. Network for Health Research. I would like to request our chairs for this session, Dr. Madhi Raj Bande, Chairman and CSC Member, Nepal Public Health Foundation. Dr. Suniti Acharya, Founding Member of Nepal Public Health Foundation. I would like to request our speakers to join us on stage and take their respected seats as well. Professor Trudy Lang, Head of the Global Health Network. Dr. Alia Nahid, Regional Lead, the Global Health Network Asia, ICDDRP. CSC Member of Nepal Public Health Foundation. request the chairs of the session, Dr. Bhati Raj Pandey and Dr. Suniti Acharya to please introduce our speakers and moderate the session. Thank you. A very important personalities in this field and really we are very happy. Now we are dividing, you know, because we are two co-chairs, we are dividing our work a bit and uh, I thought it would be great if uh, I will delegate my responsibility of uh, introducing the speakers to Dr. Suniti Asan, the other person. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and privilege for me to be a co chairing with Dr. Pane in this very important session, and which is kind of a, is the crux of the whole networking issue and we have a great experts here, all the three of them. First of all, I would like to invite Dr. Trudy, Professor Trudy Lang and her introduction is she is a senior research fellow of Green Templeton College, University of Oxford uh, currently working as the head of the Global Health Network and the School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, University of London, and she is a PhD in Public Health and Tropical Medicine in 1989 to 01. So, welcome, Dr. Trudy. Eagerly waiting to hear from you. Thanks everyone, really great to be back. And um, I don't, do we want to give a few minutes to the people at the back to come and sit and join us? See, I'm a, my mother was a primary school teacher and I'm always good at nagging people for their attention if they want to wait. Um, but I'm really, really happy to take, um, take you through what we've been doing the last few years and what has um, enticed us to be here with you today. Um, I hope you have time for questions as well. Thank you. So this is a slide I've sort of Vasi actually that shows us why we need to do this. This was a, this is the, the ratio of trials that happened during COVID, but of course it's a reflection of the 90-10 gap that we heard from this morning, and we need to work to address that. 
And it's not, um, it's not something that's impossible. I like the analogy of the mountain earlier. We're here in Nepal, the uh, world experts in mountain climate. So I think this is a really good place to start. And we can make sure that we tackle this inequity we talked about uh, so often today. So I just want to get a few across a couple of really... Oh, my slides are on here. Are they on here? Can you see my slides? Um, I just want to get across two really important concepts because especially this afternoon we go on to talking about the WHA trial agreement and, and this is something that um, you know I'm, I'm going to talk to the nurses, to the community health workers, to the, to the policy makers in the room and we have a lot of effort and, and thought spent on doing trials but you know to tackle any disease we need a whole ecosystem of health research, um, and I love how that came across earlier. And every single type of research also has some component steps that need to be done really well. And those component steps, happily, don't really vary across diseases, or where people are working, or even the type of research. And so in this coloured circle here, these are exactly what we can train our colleagues to do really well. And we can also share excellence across the globe. And so this is really the good news, you know. Um, the path of the mountain and climbing the mountain, look, this is the path. Um, we know that the challenges in doing health research are about abilities to set the question, engage with the communities, turn the question into a study, deliver the study in the practice where you're trying to work, and take those findings into practice. And I'm going to come back in a second to talk about research management and the skills needed to do that. So overall, the Global Health Network is a really unique facility. It's been around nearly 15 years now from its first origins in Africa. Um, but it was based straight away to try and unite researchers across the globe who were working maybe not in a big research institution, who wanted to find tools and training and support to do research in their own healthcare setting. And so what the Global Health Network has evolved to over the last um, well over 10 years now is there's the digital platform that you can all see online. And they, within that you'll see 60 different knowledge hubs focusing on different topics and different areas. And so that covers things like um, different disease types or different areas of research. Like there's a whole area dedicated to data science, community engagement, um, and also particular disease areas. And so whichever area you work in, you should find somewhere that aligns with your areas of interest. But the whole point is it connects it up like a science park. And so this vast digital platform also holds all the resources that those groups want to impart. So that's where you can find training courses, templates, tools and examples. So within the whole digital platform, you'll find the tools and resources to take you through all of those different um, steps in a research cycle, but also help you connect with others who can help you. And we became a WHO collaborating centre last year, which I'm so proud of, and that just helps us work um, to support the WHO in their mission to try and support research everywhere and research systems and health systems, which we talked about this morning. So some of the component knowledge hubs um, really even support networks. So many of the groups that work within the Global Health Network are networks already, and so maybe they're working on particular diseases like the um, HIV, TB, malaria, or they're working on childhood um, diseases of poverty, or they're working to try and improve the research process and do research on research. But whatever the topic is, they're all working um, in this neutral community of the Global Health Network because they want to impart their knowledge. And so this is where we're going to bring Nepal into this family uh, well and truly today um, and, and enable you all to you know, much better access all these resources that are here. I just want to call out some of the real um, useful tools that you might find on here. We have a professional development scheme for researchers um, and so within the teams that you will lead or you're part of or when you're beginning to get a whole team maybe embarking on research and they've never done before, have a look at the professional development scheme for researchers because we run this with WHO and their uh, training research unit and it tracks skills as they grow and it's, you know, Nobody finishes learning, right? And to be a researcher, you have to keep learning. And so this system works to measure your skills and competencies right the way through your careers. And you can join and you can work through different membership levels. It's completely free. Everything on the Global Health Network is free and open. 
Um, but the professional development scheme is just a really nice way to find out where knowledge gaps lie and also measure as you've learned and develop these careers. So especially nurses, you can get everybody involved with this. It would be a really nice way to show how you develop these amazing research careers um, that lie ahead. Um, Vassi showed this slide actually earlier, which is a really nice um, introduction, um, just showing how we need to, to create standards. You know, we want to create internationally competitive researchers who can apply for grants and win them, who can publish in the best places around the globe. And to do that, we need to, to develop quality research processes and deliver evidence we can trust so we can use it in our communities and change healthcare practices, but also that we can win grants and become recognised research leaders. So the barriers we've heard a bit about this morning already, um, I, heard, I always use the phrase helicopter studies as well, and that's where we need to, you know, it's okay sometimes for sponsors to come in and run drug registration trials with you, but as long as you gain from that, and as long as it's part of your research priorities and the country's research um, whole mandate, and that's a great way to bring in investment and to learn, but not to just take everything and go, and that was definitely one of the old ways of doing things. <clears throat> we undertook a big survey a few years ago to really pin down what the barriers were. And this is what led us to that curricula. But one of the things I would like to say um, came from this work is one of the biggest barriers <coughs> was also institutional support. And so we talked about that a lot today. Can I have a glass of water? <coughs> together to address, and this is exactly what the network is for, understanding where these barriers lie and working to address them. So we have this huge global family now, and how wonderful to be launching here with the pool today. And we have this leadership around the globe to take us forward. The leadership comes from absolutely everybody. We always say the Global Health Network is the community that uses it. It's a flat, open structure, and we have a number of increasing um, colleagues around the world who are joining up. Um, and we have country hubs and coordinating centres, but the overall ethos is this translation of knowledge between areas of expertise to really make sure this knowledge is transferred. So how do we do it? I've talked earlier today about really getting onto the how, and this is um, the really nice combination of having all of those online resources you can access I talked through, but having activities in your hospitals, in your laboratories, in your healthcare clinics, so that people can really work together to access that training, to run workshops, and Ali is going to talk about this more in a second. But the output of that is that people have this whole long-term access. They can do some training, they can find the tools, they can come together as a team, and it's a continuous process. Um, that, that It's going to be there for the long term, and, and we can work together. I've got two more slides left, and I just want to call out, um, I've talked to the nurses around this already, we, um, we announced just yesterday um, a new project we're doing with um, Nursing Now and the WHO, and this is to celebrate the 75-year anniversary of the WHO as well. And this is to create a mechanism for leadership for nurses, but we're also we're talking nurses, midwives, and community health workers. And I, I'm just so pleased to follow your wonderful talk, because the idea is to, to say to um, these absolutely vital members of our healthcare workforce, that they can do really important research, absolutely assessing interventions, doing whatever they, they want to do, that they can assess what they're doing in their practice to find better um, ways to um, share that with others, to publish. But it's a leadership um, opportunity as well. So we want to support a thousand nurses to lead their own studies addressing the healthcare challenges in their setting. Um, you're, we're going to be talking more about this with the team tomorrow, but please come and talk to Mahesh or any of the nurses who are now going to be the champions of this. Um, and it's a really nice way to actually act a lot of these things we're talking about, because we'll be helping them every step of the way, design the question, implement the research. I've got one important request, um, because this ties up with the reason we were in Delhi this week. We were learning about barriers to research. We've just done a huge survey across the globe, and we had nearly 4,000 responses. One of the biggest barriers to research 
all of these things we're talking about today, is institutional country level support. Now, I know with these nurses, there's no, this is about doing pragmatic research within the workplace. There are no grants for this. The nurses will be trained and supported, they'll be given visibility and a voice. But the idea is they do research that benefits their patient and that healthcare setting that's embedded with the workplace. And so one of the barriers could be um, getting these studies through institutional review and ethics review if there's a cost. And so I'm going to be talking later this week about seeing if Nepal will be the first country to step up and say, we're going to support these nurse-led studies and we're going to take them through our system without a charge for the research. Because I know that one of the barriers to research across the globe is the inherent fees and costs that can come from doing research that will benefit locally. It's perfectly good and important to charge research that comes in from outside sponsors and outside grants, but if you're trying to enhance local research leadership, take that off as a barrier, that's my plea. Now the other thing I talked about with a few people this morning was about equity, gender equity. This is where I wanted to come to my last slide. Um, this is how working together um, to enhance research capacity building in this way is really directly tackling sustainable development goals. Health, of course, we're trying to generate e evidence which will change health outcomes. Gender equity, we need more female research leaders, not just taking part in research or being part of faculty, we need women as leaders, but we also need women designed research studies. And that is, you know, I talk about malaria being a disease of, of women as well because it affects. Um, mothers and, and babies, but in, in every type of research, um, we can think more about how to make um, the designs of those studies focused on women. And, and some of these most pragmatic, straightforward, impactful studies could be really um, change outcomes for, uh, for women throughout their lives, but also um, in supporting the family. Decent work and economic growth. If we can create research leaders in Nepal, you will win grants, sponsors will come. You will engage in the world research stage, which you do already. And I like that uh, phrase earlier about um, capacity extension. Nepal has some fantastic um, research leaders. Let's spread it wider in Nepal and also raise your visibility in the world. Um, development goal nine is around infrastructure and um, systems and innovation. Somebody also mentioned earlier about the best methods. We need to make sure that resource limited settings are not left behind as we develop research methodology. And so we need to strengthen research systems and health systems with the best methods that are available. And lastly, this is all about reducing inequity and opening up these opportunities to your whole team and every member of the healthcare um, provision, including laboratories, social scientists, and all the groups we've talked about today. Thank you very much for including us in this session. And I look forward to your Thank you, Dr. Nair. I'm sorry I made a mistake while introducing Dr. Nair. She is a professor of Oxford University, not the London University. Okay, so maybe. Okay, that's the correction. Thank you very much. Uh, now, I would like to call upon Dr. Alia Alba Nahi. She is the regional lead for the Global Health Network Asia, based in Bangladesh. I think it's the ICCDB. Uh, well, all of us. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Um, Alia Nahi. She's a scientist at the ICDDBR, ICDDRB, that is the internet uh, for 35 years in infectious disease research. She's the founder of clinical research platform Bangladesh and women scientists and researchers forum at ICDDRB. Thank you very much. Please continue. Thank you very much for the kind introduction to the chairs. And it is a privilege to come back and talk to you again. And I thank Dr. Trudy Lang for creating the perfect stage for starting my talk. I'm here to talk about the Global Health Network Asia that Trudy wanted to elaborate on. But he finished the slide with four and five SDG goals. 
I want to start from there. You are very familiar with this, this slide and there are 17 goals that we, all the countries, are trying to achieve. If you look at the goal four, that is quality education, when we look at quality education, do we ever think of research education? We think of higher education, school, primary school education, and many other education, academics. But I don't think anybody thinks about research education, even including the researcher, and that is the gap. That has been the gap for many years, and that gap will continue if we don't start talking about the gap and how these gaps should be filled up. Because we all want to work in the healthcare setting, we are there, you are all champions, but there are many challenges in delivering healthcare in, in the global south. There are so many, I just picked up a few that are picked up by WHO, starting from limited public facilities to, to limited infrastructure and financial resources up to extremely unequal health access and iniquity is everywhere. But on top of everything, you can imagine that all these developing countries have huge shortage of healthcare providers who work at the ground, particularly at the doctors, nurses and the midwives. So for, for a country like Bangladesh, which is about 170 billion people, there is about less than three combined doctor, nurse, and paramedics for 1,000 people, and there are only four beds in hospitals for 10,000 people. So how can you think of providing the healthcare and quality healthcare to the whole population? That is absolutely impossible. But there are certain works that ICTRB has been doing for the country in Bangladesh and that is benefiting not only Bangladesh, but many countries in the world and globally. And the picture I'm showing you, this is not just Bangladesh picture, this is the picture for everywhere in the world, in the global south. When I was asked, that what is your secret of developing so many innovations that you do for Bangladesh and also for the world, the first thing we say that the core investment we do is in research capacity building. That is the first job for ICTDRB is to train, grow researchers who start their career. And we have a fantastic mentor mentee relationship, uh, academic environment there. So, our core our objective research, but we never start research without capacity building. Why? Because we want to generate high quality evidence and real time. When the problem is happening, find the, sol find the solution then. But just finding solution and generating evidence is not enough because we need to disseminate this to those people who will benefit from learning the health problem and the solutions, particularly those who go to the field and take care of the patients or they give health education or give some contraceptive education for the, for the poor young women. We need them to listen to this and there are many ways we try to do that in-house. For many years, maybe for more than 50 years, we have concentrated in looking at epidemiological evidence, generating evidence. We thought it is not our job. The job is for the government, the job is for the health sector who are service provider. They should take it up. Then we realized that is a mistake. We are the scientists, we are the researchers, we know the best of our environment. So if we don't try to translate it, then it will be much delayed. And we started building capacity of the health workers at all levels, doctors and health workers mostly. Unfortunately, nurses work are very limited or almost none in ICT DRB. And after hearing from all of you, particularly the previous lesson and sessions, I was so encouraged that we definitely should go forward. And why I'm telling the story, I'll come to it for a few minutes. But there has been big missed out thing. And that was not communicable disease. ICTDRB has been doing fantastic in maternal childhood infection disease. But it is a global responsibility for an organization as such to, to think about other areas where people are suffering. So what happened back in 2017, we are so uh, privileged to get a very small grant from the National Institute of Health, USA, for planning non-communicable disease and disorder capacity building in low and middle income countries. We actually picked up it is as an experimental design and we took a challenge. It's only $40,000 for a year. It is nothing for a big, big organization. 
But what we did, we picked up that and we identified various institutions where there are junior doctors working in the primary care setting and invite them who are interested to have a fellowship program for learning research and how to do research in healthcare setting. We found 17 brilliant junior doctors and we combined them with eight public researchers because we know public researchers don't talk to clinicians and don't, don't, don't understand clinical setting. And clinicians never value the public physicians. They don't value public health as a discipline for them to match with. So this is the biggest challenge for us. So we put them together at the same table. And they started learning. It was amazing to learn, uh, uh, learning for the clinician. They, they realized that they could have such an ally of public scientists who could help them learning and doing research. And this initiative became so, so encouraging for junior researchers, there's a demand. And we created a clinical research platform in Bangladesh. And we joined with the British Medical Journal and our premier postgraduate institution, Bangabandhu Shikmajik Medical University. So we bring them together to create this platform simply to teach them research. And we started with writing, writing manuscript, because in our small survey we found both the clinicians and the public scientists, they really want to be published, they want to create a track, and they want to do research, for reporting very frequently. So we did many, many uh, small level workshop. We invited BMJ uh, to uh, provide uh, guidance on manuscript writing. We went to different hospitals, almost giving services of training how to write manuscript in different hospitals with doctors. But then we realized, if the papers are written, who will review that, who will publish that? Then we realized we need to train our mentors, our journals. Then we started educating our journal editors how to review an article for a journal and that can, should be high quality research. Through our journey we realized just training mentee mentors is not enough. If the research is published, who is going to take this to practice? It is the health managers, it is the program managers, it is the government. So you started dialoguing with the healthcare professionals, public health uh, specialists, and who are working the government, private sector, urban health, everywhere. And it was found out, we took NCT as an example, it was found out they demand data. They said, you don't give us data, you don't give us evidence, how can we design our program? How would we know we are doing right or wrong? So how can we do that? We are not scientists. Then what we did, we actually invited any, anyone, any clinicians or anyone to come to a conference to present their paper. And you will be surprised to know for the first time we came to know the people in Bangladesh sitting in very remote corner doing research with their patients, with their community. And when we created the opportunity for all of them, actually we also trained them how to write an abstract in, in, in many sessions. And then we got 400 abstracts. And after very strict screening, we could publish 200 abstracts. And that was published the e-book. That was the first NCT conference in Bangladesh. That was the first e-book on NCT research. And we're amazed to see there's so many little scientists sitting in Bangladesh we never knew. Because they told us they're afraid of presenting their research because they don't know how to do research. They don't believe people will agree to their report. But we help them. And I had a great opportunity to go back to UK and see to it a tremendously highly qualified scientist, uh, mostly British scientist in Royal Academy of Science. And I was actually presenting my experience there. And after a session, a bright, young, dynamic lady came to me and told me, I am looking for you. I was really surprised. This lady doesn't know me. How does she know me? And looking for what? I said, why are you looking for me? Sorry. I didn't realize. She said, oh no, I'm looking for you. That means she meant I'm looking for someone like you. So this great mind sitting in the UK thinking of it and we, someone like me, we're sitting in a developing country. We found each other. And that lady is nobody but my favorite, Dr. Trudy Lang, sitting on the podium. That is the day we started our journey uh, and then we worked together during COVID-19 really on small grants. And I really give a um, heartfelt attitude to Trudy to think about it. And we developed a beautiful uh, pilot research on Stand By Me. This is abbreviation of a big research, the abbreviation Stand By Me. And actually, we, we summoned many, many organizations to stand by us writing different grants, supporting different organizations, junior level researchers. And those gave us experiences that what we can do together 
to help others. And then we realized that we cannot limit it to Bangladesh because there are many, many institutions all over Asia who really need this kind of support and we need to create a bigger platform. And then the key, we came with the idea of the Global Health Network Asia. So this new Global Health Network Asia was built under a new ecosystem grant for health research and data science for an action of five years plan which is funded by Gates Foundation and five institutions, the Global Health Network, HDR UK, ICDDRB, Africa CDC, and few crews in Brazil. We sat together and developed this framework, and we came up with five broader objectives, what we plan to establish in three regions, one in Asia, one in Latin American, Caribbean, and one in Africa. Our goal is to achieve in five years, uh, the first goal is research capacity strengthening, and go through the process out and our last goal is establishing a federated global strategic partnership and I call it scientific leadership. So we really want to create leaders and science leaders in the developing countries which is unthinkable even, even today. People don't think they can be scientific leaders uh, in large grants but that is our vision. Yes, it is, an, it is a very ambitious vision. That is the vision we came up with, launching the Global Health Network Asia in Cape Town. Some of our colleagues are here who joined us in Cape Town. And of course, we want to build our vision based on our knowledge mobilization, connecting existing excellence across the countries, particularly the countries we are starting with, one of them is Nepal. And we want to raise the standard of research at a high quality and set the path to they uptake the research benefit into practice. Who is this for? When we think of research, we immediately think, oh, the research should be done by the hardcore researchers or the doctors. But it is not. You have seen, even nurses can do research, and it is our mandate that we want to bring research at the grassroots level. It will be health managers, health workers, it has to be clinicians, it can be pharmacists. And what are the settings? Everywhere, not only field setting or household where we go data collection, for data collection traditionally, not only for hospital setting, it can be laboratory setting, it can be any satellite clinic setting, anywhere, there where there is a healthcare service being provided, research should be there. So you can imagine our target is very broad and that is ambitious but very necessary target. So how we do it? We don't believe in didactic lectures, we don't believe in coursework. Our work is very hands-on experience providing through, through experienced researchers' um, knowledge. So we want to do research club type of, work, type of sessions where people want to share their uh, work and we want to train them through dialogue and data clinic where people learn how to run data and how to design survey tools, how to analyze data. And it is really, really important to do some supported learning sessions so that uh, the people understand their own limitations and challenges and overcome it. And we want to do it through many various uh, ways into the workshop and seminar. I think today's seminar is also one of that. So far we have done several thing, new things. Some of them could reach global audience and some of them were limited to Bangladesh only. So many institutions starting from what is how you write an analytical plan for your protocol. How do you write a grant? So what, uh, how you mobilize your institution to connect with local um, stakeholders? So these are a very basic thing. People don't get trained. It is expected. So, uh, this is the, I don't know where it's coming from. So this program is not only hands-on training, but also provide a very, very strong focus on data science. So data is the key. If without good data, we really cannot establish our problem and we cannot measure our problem and find out solution. So we are working on data science and I don't want to go into the detail as Vasimuti presented. Secondary data analysis is very important because we don't need to collect data on an everyday basis. We have tons of data setting in many institutions. Maybe you can start with institutions asking the uh, Nepal Health Public Foundation or TGH in Nepal asking various institutions to share data to have a federated analysis to understand what is going on in Nepal. You just can pick up anything. We picked up one in Bangladesh that is micronutrient deficiency in under five children and women. 
So this is just an example that people can do. So these are the things we are trying to develop. These are examples we think TGH and Nepal will also benefit from learning from us. And as I mentioned, who would benefit? Everybody. Everybody sitting in this audience will benefit. It doesn't matter what, what and where your position is. And your colleagues that you are connected, everybody will benefit it. And you will see the benefit once you start it. So we have a five-year broad plan, broader plan, but we really want to develop a governance framework and management and our focus to support everyone, particularly junior and women in science. There are great minds among women and science suffers without the perspective of women in, in their solutions and we really want to promote science, women in science in our program and we really want to achieve our impact at the country level and also at the individual level and through creating a very strong partnership not only with TJG in Asia and the Deglobal Network Asia, or only the Deglobal Network, but also the networks sitting in Africa and Latin America and across the countries who will be coming under the umbrella of the Global Network Asia, including Nepal. So this is a very open call to all of you, and uh, we will try to reach out to you, taking the list of uh, emails from uh, team uh, in PHF. So we'll try to reach you soon, but you need to try to reach out to us as well so that we can support you. And with this beautiful picture of the, the first uh, the Global Network Conference that happened last year, I want to say goodbye to you. And if you may find some of our colleagues, you may find some of you in, in the picture. <laughs> Thank you very much. to this community, I think everybody knows him, but whatever is given to me, I'm reading it out. It says, retired professor of community medicine and public, and public health at Truman University Teaching Hospital. But I must say he's not retired. He's retired though, but he's not tired. And, and he's also the pre president of the Physicians for Social Responsibility, president of the Four Physicians for Social Responsibility Nepal. PSR. PSR is an affiliate to International Physicians uh, for Prevention of Nuclear War, which is a Nobel Peace Prize winner two times. And welcome Dr. Sharadwan for it. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, very respectable chairs of the session and uh, dignitary speakers of this last session and all the dignitaries uh, in the audience who are truly concerned and related to the health research of this country. I think uh, it's always privilege to the last speakers because uh, for two reasons. One is that a lot of things have already been expressed and reflected probably I don't need to spend time. Even if I only spend some more time, it will be exclusive for just being the last speaker. But I will be very much... Being the last speaker, I think this is my duty uh, to do, address some of the curiosity of all the dignitaries present here. I mean, naturally that uh, curiosity might be how this, uh, uh, the Global Health Network Nepal will work. Well, what will be the structure, what will be the function of this uh, uh, network in the country? So this is very natural curiosity and try, I'll try my best just to give some point which is not in complete itself but it will be just a point of departure of this uh, Nepal chapter. So this is what I'll 
uh, would like to reflect here. And uh, of course, uh, this is also my temptation uh, when we talk about the how this center will work, how this Nepal chapter of the global health network uh, will work. I just wanted to give some brief recap of the background. This network at the global level and at the national and regional level has been started after more than a decade of a campaign of World Health Organization which is called Global Health Research Forum that was established back in the last year of the last decades of the last century. And this Global Health Research Forum aimed to address 1090 gap in health research. And we know what is 1090 gap in health uh, research. And uh, it's good, and this is we are very fortunate to, to start this campaign again after uh, this Global Health uh, uh, Forum has stopped working from the first decade of this century. It's very unfortunate, but I think uh, we are here to replace it. And the second point is when you talk about health research capacity, of course uh, we are not talking just about uh, capacity in technical sense. We are not talking about just to conduct the research, but we are also talking about justice in health. And uh, I'm sure that this initiative will try again to address the 1090 gap in health research at the global level. And if there will be any uh, time in future, probably we will be discussing what 1090 gap is uh, in health research. And also, it's extremely important to understand when you talk about the uh, health science research, it's also time to counter the pseudoscience in health science, in health research. Because we have now seen many assumptions, many storytellings in health, and they are not always based in science. They are also based in pseudoscience, and this is also time to address or to encounter the pseudoscience that might confuse the people rather than helping them. Therefore, we are here again, just to remind one more point, and also, we cannot probably forget the reality that when we talk today about the health research, we are talking about the health research in the era of neoliberal economy. So we should be very, very careful. Like any dimension, any aspects of health, health research should also not be commercialized. It should not be for the profit. Therefore, we should also be careful that uh, when you talk about the health science research, health research, it should be for the people. And it should be for you know, removing, for addressing the suffering of the people. This is what probably we'll be talking, and this is why the Global Health Network Nepal is been established. And uh, I think when you talk about how it works, how this uh, health, the Global Health Network Nepal will work, I think this is just preliminary uh, concept. And this is not the final one, this is a preliminary concept. And from this point of departure, we have to start our journey of, of how it works. So I would like to say that there are three major dimensions when you talk about the functioning of the Global Health Network in Nepal. The one is, um, this is the structure, and the second is operational mechanism, and the third is activities, what we do. Of course, today we will not be able to discuss on, on activities, what we will be doing. But today we will be more focusing on the structure and operational mechanism. This is what I, I feel is, is a, as a point of departure. When you talk about the uh, structure of the Global Health Network Nepal, I think the first is uh, the when you talk, structure means I will I have just avoided one point that the structure also means this uh, the base. First of all, the, the base it means there should be some physical structure, uh, there should be somewhere 
basis. So, at the moment, the uh, Global Health Network Nepal will be based in Nepal Public Health Foundation. That is what we call a physical structure, and it will be supported by some basic facilities and supported by the human resource, needed human resource. That is one first point. And the second point, when you talk about the structure, this is mainly organization. How this, uh, the Global Health uh, Network Nepal is, uh, will be organized? So, I think when you talk about organization, I would like to, um, this is again, I, I just want to repeat it, that this is not the final one. This is one kind of uh, proposition, and we will be discussing uh, openly uh, about this issue. The coordination committee will be formed. The coordination committee will be at the moment, at this time, will be the, uh, the authority to decide about the, uh, how to go ahead uh, and how to organize, how to, I mean, uh, what kind of activities should be uh, carried out. And that organizing coordination committee, in my opinion, uh, or I would like to um, uh, propose that there should be seven to nine members uh, in, in the coordination committee representing different organizations. They might represent government or like NHRC and uh, the members in the co uh, coordination committee might represent academia because we have several academic institutions even today where many of them are present, many of them are uh, not present uh, in, in today's event. Like we have uh, Tribune University, we have uh, Katmandu University, and we have Patan Academy of Health Science, BP Memorial Institute of Health Science, and we have NAMS. I, I, it's not possible to take the name of every institution here, but I'm just taking that those academic institutions should also represent uh, in, the, in the coordination committee. And there will be civil society organizations who is, might be very, very, uh, you know, uh, engaged in health research for, for uh, decades uh, and uh, it's not necessary to, to mention the name of those civil society organizations who are involved in the uh, engaged in the health research but we know that there are a lot of civil society organizations uh, in Nepal who are engaged in health science research and we have also professional organizations uh, who should represent in the coordination committee. We have, um, like uh, today, we have a nursing association here participating. Uh, I'm not sure whether the Nepal Medical Association is participating or not, or we have health profession uh, uh, associations, or the health uh, association. Uh, there are many uh, health profession associations in the country, and they can also represent in the coordination committee. This is what I feel. Uh, that uh, a coordination committee will be formed. And of course we should also uh, uh, consider the coordination committee should also represent, like it should, be, it should be very much inclusive. This is just the example. I mean, uh, the representing gender, representing geography, and representing other many characteristics. So this is how a coordination committee is uh, envisioned. And I just wanted to propose it. And uh, maybe we can discuss, we have some uh, discussion time here, uh, this coordination committee, how it should work. And the, the coordination committee will work on its own scope. It's uh, how it should work. I mean, they will develop their own working guidelines, their directives or they can work their own internal policies. Uh, I think the coordination committee is, at the moment, uh, the authority to, to function uh, the Global Health Network Nepal chapter. So this is about the coordination committee. But in addition to coordination committee, this is a very a, a kind of policy body. It is a kind of decision-making authority of the Global Health Network. But there will be further the functioning groups, which uh, I have just named subcommittee. 
subcommittee means it's working committee. And uh, there might be three to five members in each subcommittee, and the subcommittee will represent the specialties. Because there will be a lot of different activities, and uh, there might be a subcommittee of working in the communicable diseases or in non-communicable diseases. There might be subcommittee in mental health, subcommittee in reproductive health, and there might be subcommittee in geriatric health. And there are there will be many many agendas. Even now, um, when we had in the morning, we are talking about the uh, vice chair of um, the medical education commission. He was uh, mentioning, he was talking that, oh, nobody is talking about the health profession uh, education research. Yeah? No, I think the health profession uh, education also has a lot of agenda for research, and we, we can have uh, a subcommittee to work on the health profession education research agenda. Therefore, uh, these are some of the examples that I'm just proposing. So, um, I think. Uh, this uh, committee and subcommittee works, and this is a, uh, this is a, schematically. I just wanted to, I just try to represent the uh, global health network Nepal, and it will have a coordination committee, and under the coordination committee there will have subcommittees, and this is just uh, proposition, and I, we might discuss uh, in more detail about how it works. Because without being clear how it works, probably this establishment will not have any uh, relevance. We should be very clear how should we go ahead. And how should we build the network, how should we uh, collaborate. I think there should be some uh, specific strategies, specific uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, this is what um, we feel. And operational modality, I think it's a very briefly, I just want to talk about the operational, when you talk about operational modality, it will be based on primarily on the principles of communication and sharing. Because uh, at the first level, I think we should communicate to each other and we should share our experiences. Because uh, that, that, that can be done and there might be a lot of different activities uh, to, to communicate and to share our experiences. Because we have our success stories, we have our failure studies, stories and we have achieved a lot of things and we have failed in many many areas and we have um, hurdles, we have barriers, problems and challenges and they can all be shared and communicated. And the next step will be in cooperation and support. Whoever, I mean, we all are um, facing the challenges, we are all facing the difficulties and we need to support each other. And there are many ways to support and there are many ways to cooperate to each other. I think that is another principle that this, uh, the Global Health Network Nepal will work. And the third, above all these uh, communication and cooperation, we can have collaboration. The collaboration means it's not just sharing, it's not just supporting, but working together. We'll have plenty of such opportunities to work together not only within the country, but also abroad, where we can collaborate uh, with our um, partners in the country, and we can collaborate with the partner uh, abroad, at the global level, at the regional levels. Therefore, our functional principle is communication and sharing, cooperation and support, and finally, the collaboration. I think these are a few points I just wanted to highlight, and I'm sure that uh, we can discuss further uh, how to build this uh, organization, how to form the working committees, how to form the uh, coordination committee, and uh, what should we be doing to, to uh, build our network, uh, collaboration, and communication uh, in, in health research in the country and also beyond the country. I think this is just a few points I just wanted to highlight. Uh, I'm sure that there will be, there will be more points to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Your excellent plan. I hope it works very well. Now, we have some time for 
open floor discussion. So I would like to request anybody who wants to ask question to specify from whom we want the answer. Of course, we can have, we can have general discussion also, but uh, please take note of that. So we wait for any of your queries. Thank you. Madam, SWC is a relation minor. SWC is a relation to correct person. Madam, you are a relation to correct person. Okay, I think, uh, um, uh, yes, uh, this is a very pertinent question and very relevant also. But now we are talking about our structure and organization of the Global Health Network of Nepal. I think uh, we have to deal with the Social Welfare Council, we have to deal, we have to also um, uh, fulfill the requirements of NHRC. If we now start implementing, once we start action, then we need to have, uh, we need to receive the permission from the Social Welfare Council. Uh, if the global fund is mobilized in, in the project and if we are engaged in particular research project, of course, uh, we have to um, uh, take the permission from Ethical Board of Nepal Research Council. That is, uh, they are normal process. But at this moment, we are just uh, trying to organize the structure because we are not going to separately register this as an NGO. Uh, in the country, because we are not going to register it separately. It will be a kind of um, a part of, at the moment, it will be the part of uh, work of uh, public health foundation. Therefore, at this point of time, probably we don't need to take permission from the Social Order Council. But, to repeat, if we will be engaged in particular activities, mobilizing the global uh, fund, then we have to take the permission. Thanks. I just um, hope I can hope I answer that as well. The Global Health Network is, is just a community, and it is a community, if you see what I mean. So it's um, it's been taken forward in lots of countries in the world, and it began as an open collaboration. And so the idea is, it's quite, it's really unusual actually, in that the whole um, entity, for want of a better word. It's, it exists only to facilitate and enable research rather than undertake it. So everybody's part of the Global Health Network, if you see what I mean. And so in terms of actually, if funding comes into Nepal, which I'm sure and hope it will, um, then no, those funds can go to whichever institution is deemed to be the most appropriate to receive them. But it, overall, it's more of a philosophy and a, and a collaborative family of a, of a true, what's called knowledge community or community of practice, um, it, that it can exist online, but it also can exist in person, delivering training and activities. So it's not a legal entity in its own right, and it doesn't really need to be because it's about imparting knowledge and knowledge mobilization. So I hope that helps uh, clarify. It's, a, it's an important question, so thank you. And uh, I mean, the move we are making here, I think it is very traditional in this South Asia, particularly, when we develop some kind of program or program, we actually always look for a structured body endorsed by government. That is the normal process. As Trudy just mentioned, it is unusual. Yes, it is unusual. And the community practice means, I just want to elaborate for many people, is, since it is a new concept. 
So the global network is a big platform, is a network. It does not have a, a have an office, a registration, anything. But it is housed, and they, we need some organization to host it and fun, make it functional. Like that is um, Nepal Public Foundation and do that. But this is not that the only the members, committee members, they are part of it. TGH and Nepal, what I, the way we vision, TGH and Nepal will be everybody's business. Anybody sitting here is part of TGH. And so this network, uh, there are coordinator, coordination center in Nepal, that is housing Nepal Public Foundation. The coordination center, Nepal's job would be to bring these brilliant minds together, hear from them what their needs and challenges and demands, and then create an enabling environment. So if it is training, if it is research, it is some other uh, skill building. So this will be identified by this body, and then it is beneficial with be people like everyone nurses, doctors, technologists, wherever you are. If, if that is why it is not that we should should think that the members should come forward with the creating demand. You need to also approach to TGH and Nepal to create the demand that you have. So this is a very it should be a very interactive dialogue between <coughs> the coordination center and the partners across Nepal. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. I know that we're running late, but um, so uh, I understand that you know you're uh, in the process of capacity building. But do you also have plans to actually conduct studies, or you know what will, what will be the role? Because this is going to be a big network. Uh, like you know, will there be focused on certain research areas, or let the you know different uh, branches decide? So can you highlight on that? I would like to take the privilege, then I will give it to Trudy. You asked us the very right question. Why are we doing this? The whole idea is the community will be connected to TGH in Nepal. They will be at a very higher level of their quality and stage at the global level. And our, our the network is not just independent. The network is connected with other networks, not only in Asia, Latin America and uh, Africa and other countries. So that will create an opportunity to connect diff different uh, groups for call of application. So if any institution, I just give it a very, very uh, simple example. If the nursing association in Nepal is interested in doing an assessment of the interest of research uh, among nurses, and they really want to hear uh, their feedback from different countries, TGH in Nepal, can, can have the leverage of TGH in Asia reaching out to many institutions where there are nursing, uh, nursing bodies are there. So our job will be to facilitate the network and creating relationship. But your team, whoever is leading, and their partners, they have the, they have, that will be their job to write their good grant and apply to the funding body and win the grant. It is not the situation that we will generate a grant and give it to you. So that is the case, the philosophy. Our philosophy is we make you a high level capable team of sustainable, lasting research team who can compete the global competition of this grant. And uh, there will be some failures in the beginning, but you will learn from these failures, uh, but that's also the success way. So uh, there will be opportunity for grants, and we will be notifying DGH in Nepal, like other centers. And that is also important that we facilitate to help you uh, writing the grant, what kind of uh, skills that you need, we find out your collaborators. Or if necessary, we will find you uh, experts. So this is how we will support uh, both, both sides, the Nepal side and extra group, external groups who will be supporting this network. I think I, I really liked your question around the, you know, the broadness of capacity development and, and where to start. And, the, and I think the, um, the question is with any group is, is to look at where your capacity gaps lie and what you're wanting to do. And, and then 
already there's a whole heap of resources and tools available. So if you are a group, if you're, we talked about laboratory capacity earlier and connecting up any surveillance studies with pathogen genomics. I don't know if my colleague is still here who I was talking to earlier. But um, if, if the gap is in connecting epi and, and genomics and there's some resources there, for example, or maybe the gap is in how to write an SOP or how to work out where your SOP is, there's already resources there now. What we c what you can do is use something like the professional development schemes uh, questionnaire to work out where the knowledge gaps lie in those really fundamental research skills, um, and we can point you to lots of these. And part of the, the coming weeks and months can be to show you what's available already. Um, but then it will be, uh, I think, a really interesting starting point to suggest to the Global Health Network report is to have form these working groups and then decide what your priorities are and then come back um, you know, through the colleagues across the Global Health Network to say, do these exist already or can we do something? But then the onus is, there's, we, there's expertise within the pool, of course, already. And so some of the activities that, you, that will be happening are different topics every week, um, depending on what the gaps are. It might be about regulatory, it might be about encouraging nurses as researchers, it might be how do you turn a corner of my hospital as well, um, which is really important. So um, I think one of the early steps will be to just work out precisely where you want to mobilise that existing excellence and where there are true gaps in the country that need to be brought in from colleagues elsewhere by sharing what they do. Thank you. Just, just uh, one, one minute or so. Just to respond to uh, Dr. Janice's response, of course, uh, when you talk about the capacity building, uh, I think we will not be talking about just conventionally to giving training and uh, workshop and those things, but capacity building also includes the engagement in the research itself. Therefore, this is the reason that we talk about the collaboration, the support. Yeah? Therefore, uh, we should always try, collectively try to tap the opportunities for the research uh, and uh, definitely this uh, the global health uh, network Nepal chapter will be engaged in research collectively and will try to capture all possible opportunities so uh, this is also research is all doing research also part of capacity building. Thank you very much for this I know, and the most of your uh, queries have been uh, taken care of. Well, because it's a network coming, and network uh, will include many activities. You know, uh, from training, research, uh, um, even the surveys, study, many things. You know, so uh, we have to start uh, step by step. We start from small step and go higher and higher up. So I think uh, now, uh, since I don't see any hand raised, and it's the time also is, you know, there is time constraint, um, I think now we move to, uh, we close the discussion here. Huh? There is a call, uh, uh, I think there is a thing, a formation of an organizing committee. As per line uh, with uh, what Sharad, Dr. Sharadwanta discussed, you know, this, the organizing committee, I mean, we need another session. So I think based on whatever he said, we cannot decide it now here, and there will be another meeting, and then that will decide the details of the organizing committee and how it will function. Thank you very much. Thank you, respected speakers, for your insightful presentations and the participants for the questions. <clears throat> now I would like to request our chairs of the session, Dr. Bandi Raj Pandey and Dr. Suniti Acharya, to please present the token of appreciation to Professor Dr. Sharad Wanta.
We will be having Dr. Vasi Murthy join us virtually from Google Meet, so please stay seated. I would like to request our chairs of the session, Dr. Buddha Bosnet, President of International Society of Mountain Medicine, Professor Trudy Lang, Head of the Global Health Network, to please join us on stage and take their respected seats. The Associate Professor of Public Health, Kathmandu University School of Medicine. Review Board, Nepal Health Research Council. I would also like to announce that due to some unforeseen circumstances, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Sharma will not be joining us with the panel discussion. Presentation sent to us by Dr. Vasi Murthy, and then we will proceed with the panel discussion. Thank you. Countries are basically, will this work? What are your barriers? Where are your concerns about implementation? And I know that was a really quick gallop through from Vasi, but we can highlight some of the points he raised um, and, and we can help to stimulate the discussion. Um, I can't remember if we're recording this or what our mechanism is feeding back for Vasi. Are you taking notes, my Or Are we recording the session? Perfect. So, um, we'll, so we'll be really able. Is Vasi online? Ah, um, Professor Lang, I would like to interrupt, sorry, <laughs> but Dr. Vasi has joined us to Google Me. No. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, everyone. No need for applause. I'm so sorry that I can't be there in person, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to receiving some feedback from the meeting about your perspectives. I can see the room now. Thank you. Hi, so, Vassi, sorry, it's I'm, Trudy. I've just joined the second, so please go ahead, Trudy, with what you're saying. Yeah, so, Vassi, we've, we've had your film, so that's fantastic. And I've just prompted everybody to say that this is such an important opportunity that you really want to hear from the countries. And we've had a fantastic day here um, looking at uh, research capacity strengthening in Nepal. We've got a really good panel here, so what I suggest we do is, is go across the panel, including my fellow chair, just to get initial responses to your talk. Um, and then um, really drill down some of the elements and then perhaps we can take to the floor and they can ask you questions or direct their feedback. So I'll just pass to Buddha and we'll go through across the panel. So, uh, Dr. Murthy, that was very nice. Very, very informative talk. Yeah, uh, so we're, in Nepal, we're very interested in uh, conducting randomized controlled trials. Uh, one of the things that struck me was that Many trials are, you know, just this sort of like, uh, you know, this is not exactly very pertinent, but I can't help saying this, because, you know, there are all these beautifully done trials, but there is no implementation. You know, like, it's, it's, it's just trials, are, for example, this tranosamic acid, you know, that is very, very useful, and it will prevent death in, in uh, patients who are having postpartum hemorrhage. It's not implemented. A cheap uh, drug. Latent TB treatment, to cite another example, you know, can, can help really get to the WHO 2035 NTB guidelines. Why, you know, we're not implementing this. So, just, these are just two examples. These are what I call low hanging fruits that we are not plucking that I think WHO needs to push, you know, these countries like ours to do even more because people listen to the WHO. And, and I, you know, for me, I'm like, uh, like, I wish we could do something about these low hanging fruits. This is just by the way talk, but I, I think, you know, like getting involved with randomized controlled trials, like, I can't help saying this, is like uh, Nepal got involved with the recovery trial in a big way, you 
you know, besides the UK, Nepal contributed the most number of patients, and in a telling way because we were instrumental in terms of sample size in showing that high dose steroids is detrimental for a patient with COVID-19 who is hospitalized. So, you know, and it was like you pointed out getting involved with a platform trial. This was a platform, it was an adaptive trial, it was great. There was a lot of capacity building and I liked what you put down there about adaptive trials and, and, and for us, the COVID-19 time, this is sort of like uh, underreported, was, was a very good opportunity in terms of capacity building in getting involved with uh, with therapy changing trials like the recovery trial and and you know so so I, I think like all these guidelines that you're bringing up are going to be very useful because we're we're on the cusp of all of this but I sort of like you know I'm saddened by the fact that implementation is very poor thank you so much Uh, uh, Dr. Vasky, do you want to say something in response or? Uh, yeah, I could just comment that that's very, very important um, pertinent points. The, I think it's really centrally important that trials are seen as just one part of, and, and to clarify, we at WHO didn't request that the resolution that I talked about um, was focused only on randomized control trials. I, that, that is just um, the way that it went. The member states uh, initiated that. From our perspective, we have to. I always want to point to the cycle of evidence gaps, implementation, needs for research, and so it's great to try to examine why interventions are not being implemented. I think sometimes this can be because the right people were not included in the research. Um, that's one, what, there are many, many reasons for this. But I think one small part of a very complex issue is always include the policy makers and the clinical practitioners and the users in the conceptualization and the design and the implementation of any research. The more we can avoid the gap between knowledge generation and uptake, from the beginning, from the design phase, the better. We, we really should be having researchers working you know, on their own, disconnected from those who are going to be implementing. There, just to mention, you know, I think one example that I've seen recently, I don't, did I mention it in the talk, is, is the emotive trial. Are you familiar with the emotive trial? Um, this is a bundle of, exactly as you said, postpartum hemorrhage interventions. And what I think is really great about that is there were available interventions, including tranexamic acid, it was cluster randomized. And I think sometimes cluster randomized, randomizing in the hospital or the, the, the center level, this can be one way. If the reason the implementation is not being used is because there is some clarity about exactly how best to deliver bundles of diagnostics and, intervention, and actual interventions, then cluster randomized trials, you know, is, is one way of doing it. But I think having the policymakers involved up front and having some accountability on the system side, that if we show this, if we demonstrate this in our country, we're all on the same page that we are going to find a way to roll it, to roll it out as soon as possible. And ensuring that the way the intervention is designed in the trials absolutely takes on board the um, the perspective of the delivery folks, the clinical practitioners and the national programs, they should be involved in actually designing this kind of practical trials so that the interventions in the trials are, can immediately be rolled out. Those are just some immediate thoughts that I had. Okay, th thank you. Thank you for your response. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Zona Kuirala with the Partner Academy of Health Science. I also am part of the uh, Nepal Health Resource Council as an infectious disease consultant, and I uh, actually work, not, not work, but communicate with you frequently for the solidarity, first solidarity trial, which you led uh, from WHO. Thank you. Yeah, but I, uh, later on, I, we, we participate, Nepal participated in the second uh, phase trial, also, and I led that for the country. 
so I just wanted to make a few comments. Uh, number one, I think the the network, the Global Health uh, Network uh, for Research, is a great initiation, and it's uh, I think it'll be a good addition for uh, Nepal Health Research Council as well as the Nepal Public Health uh, Foundation. And I, I have all the you know best wishes. Uh, as we learn from you know solidarity trial and recovery trial, Dr. Both of us met, uh, led in Nepal. Uh, you know, Nepal gained a lot of experience in research. We trained a lot of uh, people, and it actually helped to uh, in improve the capacity uh, for our uh, institution, not only academic institution, but also many, uh, uh, many other uh, hospitals, government hospitals, public hospitals, even in the remote areas of Nepal. Uh, so I think uh, the networking is a great opportunity to build capacity. There's no doubt about that. Um, uh, number two, we are in the process of actually revising the guidelines because this is a guideline, clinical uh, trial uh, guideline session. Actually, we are in the process of uh, revising the uh, clinical trial guideline for Nepal. Uh, there are multiple issues. Uh, one, this guideline is old. Of course, it has to be updated uh, based on, you know, the, the world is changing. So many things have changed. Nepal is changing. We have so, so much more research capacity compared to when the guideline was uh, made uh, a long time ago. And uh, also our, uh, not only guideline, but I think we even probably need act to improve our resource capacity because, uh, you know, a, a, a few things. Number one, let's say if we want to bring a new molecule to the country, uh, there is Department of Drug Administration, which is responsible. But Department of Drug Administration does not have capacity to do any research or regulatory research or oversee research. Uh, so this is being done by the Nepal Health Research Council. But Nepal Health Research Council does not have authority to regulate the drug. So they, they have to work together. So there is sometimes it's difficult for the researchers to, uh, you know, initiate research, even to start research. Sometimes they get uh, discouraged because of the, you know, the regulatory hurdles. So uh, I think the, the guidelines, the regulations should be uh, should be helpful, should be uh, help, should help to you know uh, help the researchers to start the research, not hinder the research. So that's what I think. Uh, we, we hopefully we'll get there. There are a few people in the room who are involved in the guideline committee. Uh, so that's uh, uh, number one. Uh, number two, we don't have uh, you know device-related regulatory agency, you know, as such. Uh, so if we want to bring a new medical device uh, or new medical technology, there is no real, uh, you know, agency that, you know, one agency that we can go to. Uh, the, the Drug Administration does not have any, uh, any, uh, I mean, uh, let's say expertise uh, to regulate that. I think they don't even have authority. So that's something else, you know, we need to, uh, we probably need a new act and things like that. So, and, and then we can think about how to go about doing uh, studies to bring a new technology or to new uh, tools uh, to the country. And most of the time, you know, like any uh, other uh, countries outside the Western world, we follow the, you know, Western world's medicine, Western world's technology, without knowing, you know, how effective it is on us, without knowing, you know, let's say, you know, most of the drugs come out of U.S., of course, uh, Europe and other countries too. Uh, but those are, we know that the U.S., let's say, body weight is what? Average is like 75, 80 kilos. And whereas Nepal's, you know, average weight is probably 50 to 60 kilograms. We still use the large dose, you know, medicines. Uh, so, I mean, that's one example. So, I think it's very important for us to build the capacity to test those drugs in our country. Uh, I think uh, the WHO guidelines is great in that, but I think we need a lot more guidance uh, from WHO and help from networks uh, to uh, improve that. And the third thing I wanted to say to the audience that you know, we have a lot of young audience here, uh, research is a type of culture. So we have to develop research culture. I mean, this. Uh, audience is already motivated, that's why they are here, they're already doing research. But I think in addition to that, uh, what I've seen in Western countries is, you know, the research is already built into the curriculum right from the grade school, which we lack. 
our grade schools or even the colleges are, I mean, the education system is such that we study, even I did, to pass the exam. That's the only goal for, you know, to, uh, for up, up the goal of the education. At least that's how we are motivated by the teacher to get the good grades, pass the exam, go to a better university, probably in Western universities, <laughs> if you can, if you have access. Uh, but we don't have that, you know, research inculcated in our curriculum because I think that's important. We don't have you know, that creative thinking, training to, you know, think creative, creativity or uh, innovation, invention. We don't have that. We don't get projects to, you know, write projects or uh, perform projects or, you know, come up with new ideas. I think that's something uh, we have to build into our education system also. So that's what I want to say. Thank you. I, I just wanted to take up his last point about uh, getting younger people to break the mold. And the third speaker here it did exactly that. It's Diptes Arialis. Um, I'm, I'm very proud to say that I, I taught him physiology many years ago, the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve, which he remembers very well. But, but he broke the mold. So just to uh, tell Janak that there is hope. Thank you so much. So, uh, so uh, I just like to share a couple of things here. So, uh, I, uh, my background is uh, I'm a clinician. I'm an intensivist. I worked for many years in ICUs uh, across like different hospitals in Nepal. And what I realized that uh, my patients are not getting the right answers. So, like I read so many papers, so many guidelines, protocols, which were based on evidence from high-income countries and like uh, from from settings that were very on like uh, different from ours and I couldn't find answers to like many things so for the last uh, few years uh, I can share my experience of how we are trying to break the barrier and challenges by incorporating the research culture and building the local research capacity within a group of ICU uh, physicians, nurses and pharmacists we have built a network, a research uh, strengthening uh, kind of work. I can share those slides with you if you all are interested. And uh, the other thing is, uh, right now I'm also working as an ethical review board member uh, in Nepal Health Research Council, and we are working on uh, like uh, strengthening the current protocols and guidelines, starting from the design and implementation and post-implementation effect of clinical trials in Nepal. And uh, Dr. Zanak is leading the team. I am helping uh, the team with uh, the initial drafts. So we may need uh, your help there. And the other thing is uh, we have started discussing about community engagement, uh, more discussions on post-trial engagements of the participants and the, and the cycle of uh, like uh, uh, translating the findings back to the community and the bedside. So these things, these sort of things are being discussed. Uh, among the research uh, fraternity these days. Uh, but I really like to share some of the work we have done with the ICU if you are all interested. Uh, I can finish that in maybe five, six minutes. Would you like to see those slides? I think people are waiting for tea. <laughs> and then we have someone here just to say thank you. I mean, we, we appreciate your enthusiasm. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Archana Shrasta. I'm an associate professor of public health um, at Kathmandu University School of Medical Sciences. And uh, by training, I'm an epidemiologist. And my experience in uh, clinical trials come mostly from the community-based uh, trials, um, basically testing um, lifestyle modifications uh, in different settings like schools, or work sites, um, and communities. Uh, to make changes in non-communicable disease control and prevention in Nepal. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, I think it was very encouraging and uh, enthusiastic. I'm very enthusiastic to hear about the WHA uh, regulations uh, because I remember like, my, my, from my own experience when I uh, submitted my first clinical trial a protocol to the ethical board in Nepal, uh, the first question that was asked uh, was, how does it make you qualified to lead a community um, 
based clinical trial, which was very interesting. I was not expecting that. Uh, and I, I have a, quite a robust training. I graduated from the University of Washington with, um, with a PhD in epidemiology. Uh, it was very, I felt very encouraging from the point of view of uh, Nepal government to ensure that the quality was um, quality of the trial would be really great. But at the same time, it was really like uh, I was really saddened by the fact that uh, we are, as a Nepali, not as an individual, but as a Nepali investigator, as an investigators from LMIC, uh, we have to prove a point that we can uh, lead some. Clinical trial, which was actually a pretty, pretty straightforward, uh, the protocol that we had submitted. So, I, I, coming back to the regula regulation, I think it is very encouraging uh, to hear about uh, making like, making the things transparent, building the uh, capacity within the LMIC countries, within the local investigators, um, also like um, maintaining the high quality clinical trial that can be used by the community for the improvement of the health. So few things that I um, faced, a uh, few challenges that I faced during uh, my experience um, in clinical trials. First of all, I think it is a challenge of everyone to get the funding because uh, we in Nepal, we don't have a funding agency uh, to do any research, like not just uh, related to the clinical trial. So I think that has been a major limitation in terms of bringing our own ideas, experience, or a relevant, context-relevant uh, research question, because most of the times we are applying to um, uh, external funding agencies or international funding agencies, and, and this, uh, these agencies will fund uh, the trials or any research that has that is of interest to them. Uh, they, that may or may not be a priority or relevant in context of Nepal, but uh, we don't have much options in that. Uh, second is the capacity building, and I uh, hear um, very clearly what Dr. Jonak has said, that historically our academia uh, uh, lacks research culture. We have been trained to think about research in terms of thesis or dissertation, uh, more rather than solving a public health or clinical problem. So I guess uh, that has been uh, one of the like background that it is very hard to find uh, qualified, uh, experienced uh, researcher uh, within the country that has been well trained and because uh, the training opportunities are not that much available in the country. So I'll stop here thinking that everybody is waiting for tea. Thank you very much. What we'll do, I think, is just take any really key points we would love to hear from you um, on the floor, and otherwise we'll pass, because Vasi is supposed to be sat here, not me, so we'll pass to Vasi to finish. But um, would, has anybody got any comments or questions for the panel or for Vasi, or really the comments on, on what you heard about the uh, WHA declaration? No? No comments? Mahesh. Uh, actually, my question was like, we have heard many complaints when the clinical trial is being done in Nepal. And uh, the issue comes as the ethical perspective, you know, whether the subjects are being used, the purpose of the funders or some the researchers, and how is that, like a WHO guideline and all, are trying to address these issues because this has been an issue in the past. And this has been an issue of the third world countries. And uh, because you people are involved in the clinical trial, how have we tried to ensure that such complaints did not come? Okay. So it's just the thing I wanted to raise. I want to say before we wrap it up, please. Yes, I'll be brief. I know you're heading off the team. So first of all, I really hope that I haven't blown my chance to uh, actually get invited out to Nepal again. I'm so sorry that I, I can't be there. I just have too much on at the moment. Um, so 
the, my, my main point is that the guidance we are developing is just the beginning of the process that we want to engage with any country stakeholders that are interested in some practical discussions about how we can maybe use this as some momentum to further develop capacity. And then my second point is any we really, I hope, need to be thinking about just practical improvements in health outcomes and impact and research not as being some kind of disconnected elite um, type of activity, but how, at the service of the health system, how can research be an arm of the health system? And Nepal could be ahead of many other countries in thinking this through in an applied way. And I think that the support that you're getting from TGHN can also help. But um, we as WHO will do anything we can to, you know, to help you on this journey. But I really think you can be ahead. But it starts with you thinking yourselves what you really need practically to advance the health outcomes and how can we apply. And then what are the best practices? And what, what you'll see in the document when it goes to the public consultation is that there are some practical practical steps that we're suggesting that can really help you and any other country advance. One of those, I think now, is um, inter-agency prioritization and coordination. As people advance in developing their capacities, we tend to see silos and delays and inefficiencies in lack of coordination between working in the silos. This happens all over the world. It's in high income, middle income, and low income. So it really is a best practice and not an optional activity for the different agencies to work together, to prioritize, to coordinate. And then finally, another best practice, which is again not optional, relates to my anxious question. Everybody knows the problems we have with trust in science at the moment. And I think this is related to the fact that we have to have communities and participants engaged early on in the discussions about what research occurs and the results need to be reported back to them as a, as a priority and they need to be fully part of the process in, in the whole design, implementation and reporting part of, of research. Otherwise, it's normal that over time we start to have miscommunications and, and trust your words. But anyway, I don't want to stand in between everyone and, and tea and I, I hope I will be able to see you all soon at, at another meeting. Maybe next year when we will have the guidance available and we could have some discussions about how it could support some next steps for one example. Thank you, I'll stop there. So we, we want to thank you even more and, and we hope that in July, uh, you know, we'll be, when this, uh, when this paper comes out, here, what? That's we've been talking about how you want to have the um, feedback from the regions on the implementation of the guidelines. And so, yes, uh, exactly. I think there's strong, um, encouragement. Can everybody agree um, we'll, we'll all, that the, the uh, Nepal contingent will be looking out for it and, and giving you lots of feedback? Yes. Thank you. July. So Dr. Zanak is going to coordinate it. Okay, so thank you so much uh, again. And thanks, Dr. Mbukia. Thank you, everybody, for your very active participation and uh, for something, you know, that is uh, these uh, trials uh, at least in Western medicine, form the backbone of evidence base. So thank you all, and I think we will uh, close the session and have tea. Thank you. Bye -bye. Uh, before we go for tea, I would like to thank you, Dr. Bosman, for your closing remarks and for moderating this session. Thank you, respected panelists, for your insightful inputs. And thank you, Dr. Mosley, for your insightful presentation and for making the time to attend our seminar by Rudo Meet. Now I would like to request our chair for this session, Dr. Rudo Vasnet and Professor Trudy Lang, to please present the token of appreciation to our respective panelists. Dr. Jana Prasad Boirala. Dr. Arjuna Shrestha. And Dr. Nitesh Arya.
I would like to request Dr. Manish Kumar Maske to present the token of appreciation to Dr. Buddha Basu. Thank you. I would like to request you all to join us for high tea. 